Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to the game gallery. And oh my god, we're on time. Who'd have thought that? Sure are. Yeah, I'm so used to doing this show in CP in CPT. You know. <laughs> well, serious, I thought we were just going on at uh uh, at noon, and then apparently we're supposed to be going on at eleven thirty this whole time. Yeah, so, yeah, this yeah. whole time we're going on. We're supposed to be going on eleven thirty. Well, you know, ninety minutes, eleven thirty to one. There we go. That's the whole thing. Um, how you guys doing out there? I'm Solar Gray, the Cinematic Sorcerer, and um, yeah, I've been I've been trying to make stuff better, and this is um, our next to last show of 2018. Well, it's my last show of yeah, 2018. Yeah, it's your last show of yeah. 2018. So yeah, that's... I'm gonna be I'm gonna be gone. Got uh, family vacation next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna be on family oh. vacation. I'm a vacation. giant on that screen. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Let me see what I can do. I'm making you just a little bit less uh, monstrous. A little bit less. A little bit less. Yeah, there we. go. That should be the thing right there. So yeah, let's take a look at you. Oh yeah, there you. Oh, are. much better, much yeah, better. Yeah, there you are. There not you are. not gonna look at every pore on my face now. Uh, oh, but but they're so pretty. They're, they're, they're not they're so though. Pretty. They're expressly not. Yeah, they're so pretty. I don't know, man. You you got more fans on your show on this <laughs> show than I do, man. This is, you know, a really big thing and a really big thing. So yeah, um, <clears throat> we got a whole bunch of stuff going down. We have done so so many things over the past couple of a couple of weeks you know so many on the past couple of weeks and um we've got some stuff we've we've got some stuff to talk about like you wouldn't believe but what i'm doing is i'm pulling up um a couple of different things for you guys just pulling up a couple of different things because man do we got announcements oh so many announcements um yeah, I've been doing I've been doing more stuff on the archive. Been doing more stuff on the archive. So the people that are subscribed to us on YouTube <coughs> have been getting announcements like all week. Yes, hey, I look, as look. as one who subscribes to us on YouTube, uh, <laughs> I've been getting a lot of announcements. Yeah, yeah. I mean, seriously, it's been um, it has been like, hey, we're we're going here. We're doing this thing. Um, We've got this announcement. Funny thing, I've been getting texts all week, right? Texts, texts, okay. I've been getting so many texts all weeks because one of the Instagram notices that I that I filled in Texas just now finished uploading. Ah. Yesterday. Just now finished uploading yesterday. So I got people going, oh my God, are you in Texas? And I'm like, <laughs> no. Well, not okay. currently, but yeah, you know, no, I have been known to be in Texas. Yes, but yeah. uh, currently, I'm not in Texas. Um, at the moment, I'm very much, um, I'm very much, um, like in California because that's where the Wizard's Tower yeah, I was gonna is. Yes, the usual Wizard Tower, uh, same bat time, same bat channel sort of business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So at the moment, I'm like, no, I'm in California. I'm I'm at the regular Wizard's Tower. I'm just, yeah, you know, I'm. I'm here. Oh, wait, wait. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The internet isn't always in real time. <laughs> Most of the time, in fact, it's it's not in real time. Yeah. yeah. No. no, there's like a couple of second lag. This one, <laughs> this one lagged out. Um, hang on. I'm going to look at him for a minute. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll respond to, uh, to, the, to the chat there. I, I am very festive, as usual, uh, though this time I do have a hat. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, man, uh, thank you. Thank you for showing up. Absolutely. I didn't want to sneeze on camera again. Blah, and all yeah. that stuff. Um, I am so, so, like, I've got the worst, worst kind of hangover. You were telling right me about now. that. So what, what, what makes it such a terrible hangover? I didn't drink. Ah, yep, yeah, that's, that's going to do it. Yeah, because, you know, it's like, you know, for those of you guys that know me, I ain't a drinker. I ain't, you know, the, the drinking and the drugs and all that stuff. I've got other wacky stuff to keep my mind in an altered state. But, um, yeah, I'm telling you, like, the worst type of hangover you can have is one that you didn't earn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, you're you're saying it's a more more a tiredness hangover, mm -hmm. and I feel like uh, 
Most anyone over the age of about uh, 30 or so is going to recognize that feeling very well. You calling me old? Yeah, old man. I'm working on catching up, but, you know, I got uh, I got a little time, though. All right. <laughs> I'm going to just say one thing. Oh, yeah? Wait. <laughs> Yeah, hey, but, <laughs> look, if I didn't hassle you, who would? Um, well, <laughs> that is a very good question. And the truth is, I'm going to say, um, why none other than the deck mob over ah, in MP City. That's who would give me crap. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, hey, yeah, that's right. I know you're there. I know you're there. I'm giving you your shout out at the beginning, trying to keep the show tight. Tight. Yeah, yeah trying try, try, try to, try to keep the show all nice and tight. Nice and tight. Yeah. But um, if we don't keep the show nice and tight, that's fine. You know why? Why is that fine? Because they can always <laughs> oh, good grief. tell us that the show isn't tight. Add back in the deck at gmail.com. They can also um, do a whole bunch of stuff over on YouTube at YouTube. Just look for bid P B I D underscore or B I D P or back in the deck. You know, we've got a YouTube channel that the archive is going back up on. Um, they can also join Deckers on the book and tell us all that stuff. You know, that's what I got to say. Um, because over on ba- over on Deckers on the book, um, you've been posting a whole bunch of stuff on what you've been painting. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've been posting pictures of absolutely nothing because I've been managing everything else. But they can also let us know that uh, the show isn't in real time because they can listen to our pre-recorded ones over on SoundCloud at SoundCloud slash BidP. Yeah. And, of course, they can always check us out on um, Instagram. Oh, yeah, on the Instagram. I'm a big fan of the Instagram. And, um, yeah, so they can always do that jazz over yeah. there. So, God, yeah, this thing is so loud. I was yeah, going to say it like that. That's, that's assaulting the, the speakers. Yeah. You say assaulting the speakers. I, I'm, I'm going to say, nah, nah, nah <laughs> it's not there. Ha-ha, that's right. So, so, yeah, we got some stuff that we're talking about. It's funny, when you texted me yesterday... Saying, "Hey, are we uh, are 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 we are we doing the thing tomorrow? And if so, what's the topic?" Brr. I'm like, "Is he mad? Is, is, he, is I, he?" I don't feel like I added the brr in there. I feel like that may have been a little uh, projection from you. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh yeah? yeah, yeah. Were you yeah. were you cranky on your own? Huh? I told you, I'm 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 always cranky. But, oh, no, yeah. but no, it's one of those things of when you communicate with people in print. Yeah. You don't get inflection. You sure don't. So it's really easy to be like, you know, mother, he th- t- nice to see you. Oh, yeah, he's sitting up going, oh, nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, oh, that Key and Peele sketch was uh, was spot on. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, well, yeah, we, we uh, had talked about doing, um, you know, to, to answer some of the deck mob, um, we, we're talking about uh, some of the exciting new games that uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about before. Yes. Um, and uh, some of them I've played, and I can't remember if you said you had played any of these, uh, what they're called, like, legacy-style games. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're going to get to legacy-style games today, and gonna talk about a couple of other things you know we've been trying to get over to this escape room game yeah yeah you've mentioned that it looks really cool yeah have not been able to do that yet yeah have not um got a fun story from yesterday trying Uh to prep for the show and Mm -hmm. all that stuff so we'll get to that in that segment but um yeah i've been i've been doing what i can to like you know give out stuff and things like that so um yeah, there, there's, again, it's the season, it's the holiday season, you know, and <clears throat> funny thing about being in media. Okay. okay? Um, when you're in media, this time of year comes a special type of lots of meetings, and that okay. is, who am I talking to? Is there a war on Christmas? Yes. Oh, jeez. There is a war on Christmas. All that stuff. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is. Actually, Christmas has declared war on my pocketbook. That's really <laughs> what it is. Yeah, um, I think uh, I bought two presents and everything else I made this year. I mean, you know, like, bought inexpensive materials, obviously. Right, but, yeah, right. uh, in an effort to to uh, withstand the assault of the war on 
the the war Christmas is waging on me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I bought a board game for my sister, and I bought a blanket for my daughter, and some other little little uh, things for her. Yeah, that uh, pretty much covers the whole bonus, didn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but bonus. What job you work at that gets bonuses anymore? Sheesh. Hey, I, you know what? My bonus is that you're here, Aww. and that you guys are here, Aww. and that we finally got the Patreon. Hey, that's right. You know, that's, that's right. That's right. That's my bonus. And we got four patrons. Yeah. You know, um, right here um, on Dark Side of the Moon or Dark Side of the Room. Believe it or not, that was my bonus. That nice. was my bonus. Getting Very an good. episode of Dark Side of the Room reviews up and going because I had to do it. Yeah. I had to do it. I really had to do it yesterday. I'm like, okay, it's the season. Um, schools are out. You know, there's there's no kids. Like, all the kids are either at their houses or at their friends' houses and all that jazz. So I finally did it. You know what I did? What'd you do? I saw Aquaman. Yeah. I had to go see Aquaman. Yeah. I, uh, I have pretty much seen virtually nothing in the movies in a very long time. Um, yep. So, <laughs> got that going for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, movies are what we do here, so I yes. have to go to the movies. It's part now. of your job. For yeah. me, it's it's part of my no time to do anything or money to do whatever. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, I got I got the bonus. Um, I got the bonus of you know heading over to the movie theater uh, with the Hobbit. You know, uh, well, well, no, she ain't no Hobbit. You know, I, say, I thought she was vixen. going on a quest with a bunch of dwarves, but nah, that was a Quiznos, and my girl tried to rob it. <laughs> You know, nah, she because if she was a hobbit, then you know she wouldn't hang out at the den in, in her den, which is slightly below ground level, and it's always kind of cool. You know, I I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the where you're going with this. Like, so you're saying she she does hang out in the den or does well, yeah, not? Yeah, yeah. She I mean she just hangs out at the den and she you know um, likes eating good meals and stuff like that. And yeah, she's a little short, but she ain't no hobbit. Okay, she All ain't right. no hobbit. She just. Like sitting in, you know, in, in I mean, her little den. And, it, you know. in, in her defense, I also love sitting in cool, dark places eating delicious food. Yeah, so, exactly. I mean, exactly. I feel like that's not that, that unusual. I mean, I know she does hang out with a wizard, and sometimes we go on long walks and all that stuff, but she ain't no hobbit. <laughs> all right? That, that's all I'm saying. Well, uh, you know. the, the, the spoiler-free uh, soundbite review of Aquaman. So good, no good. You're just gonna have to go over to YouTube and watch the review now, ah, ain't you? Well, that's right. Is, is the review the soundbite? Huh? Uh, the soundbite is yeah. in the review. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. Yeah, the sound view. The 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 soundbite is in there. Um, but I will say this: a spoiler. Um, the spoiler-free review of all this stuff. One, it's not as good as Wonder Woman. Okay. Okay. Um. But it is the most fun DC um, extended huh. universe movie ever. That uh, James, is a s- strong statement. No, honestly, James yeah. Wan. Um, one, my favorite scene, the best shot scene in the movie, is very indicative of James Wan. If you guys don't know who James Wan is, he is a horror director. He hmm. is from the Conjuring franchise, like the Conjuring, Annabelle, you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. But watching this movie. You could see that this guy, okay, this guy wanted to make this movie. Nice. And everything that is in this movie, you could see as it was shot, was this dude is a fan of Mm -hmm. the source material. In all of its silliness, he is a fan. Like... Um, you can. There are some reviews that show out that talk about a whole lot of things, and one of the reviews that I watch is from um, a guy named Bob, and he made it clear. It's like, yeah, you know, you want a giant coliseum spectacle where you have a whole bunch of stuff on the line that pauses for a moment to watch an octopus play the drums. Yeah, but you know what? This is a movie about Aquaman. What did you want? <laughs> you know. So, yeah, and I think that something that we're seeing now is. Um, a really exciting change. I mean, not now, like, oh, just super recent, but in the last 10 years, the nerds who grew up loving this stuff as kids and, like you say, got really familiar with the source material Mm -hmm. and all its silliness. Oh, yeah. They grew up to be the actors and directors and everybody else involved in the movies that are actually 
you, you start to see some of these people actually have this love of the projects they're working on that is a love born of a deep fandom from when they were kids. And, I, you know, you see it in a lot of the Marvel movies. Um, I will personally stick by the fact that um, while a lot of people may not like the new Star Trek movies that J.J. Abrams did, I think they're absolutely a love letter of someone who loves Star Trek and wanted to do a different take on it, and I enjoyed them for what they were. You know, I almost agree with you on that. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy them because I loved the first two of yeah. the Star Trek movies. Um, but you're right. It was a love letter, but it was a love letter to Star Wars. Which yes. Which is probably why you liked it a lot. Oh, um, yeah. In that Absolutely. Sense. And they, likewise, when he did Force Awakens, also, uh, you could tell, I mean, even all the stories about how miserable he was by the end of it, because of <laughs> Disney looming over him, he, that was clearly a project he loved. Mm-hmm. And he put an incredible amount of work in his heart and his just everything into doing this project that was very important to him on a personal level. Right. And that's something that we couldn't have seen 30 years ago when people were making these movies because that source material didn't have a chance to grow up with the people. Well, we wouldn't have been able to see it with these properties, but, you know, well, um, sure. good filmmakers have been doing it forever. Yes. Like, you know, yes. Let, let's not forget your franchise was mm-hmm. nothing but a love letter to the old serials of Buck Rogers and uh, Flash Gordon yeah. and all and, that other stuff. Yeah, so. Star Wars is absolutely, you know, based on all the old uh, pulp sci-fi, the old samurai movies, the old World War II movies. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I mean, to the point where it's shot for shot retakes of some of that stuff. Yeah. But it doesn't make it bad. Again, it's it's this the people who grew up with that stuff going, I want to just pour this into everything I love or pour everything I love into this project and make something cool. So I'm excited to hear that Aquaman is likewise doing some of that. Oh yeah, it is. I'm not going to lie. It is so like the movie is so silly and fu- like it's not weed and silly. It's not, it's not bathing in bathos. Okay. You don't have a okay. whole bunch of, um, poorly placed one line comedy things <laughs> to try and cut this tension from a scene because good. James Wan is a horror director. Good. So good. if there's some tension, he's gonna let you sit with it. However, there's not much tension. Okay. <laughs> that's the thing. So um, it, it's got that that silliness that's kind of inherent to the, like the concept of Aquaman going pretty good. Well um okay. Everything you want in an Aquaman movie okay. is there. Okay. And everything you want in an Aquaman sequel is there. Oh, um, okay. Everything that should be in an Aquaman sequel is actually in, in this one, but that's a totally different thing. But he's a dude who talks to fish, but he got my letter. He really got my letter. Okay. Because I'm just going to say this. The climax of the movie was a war of three armies Okay, with Aquaman riding a kaiju. That's all. That That's... All right, yeah, I was going to say, like, <laughs> that That right there is pretty much enough for me <laughs> to watch money. the movie. Like, I, I want to see Aquaman ride a kaiju and fight a sweet battle. Yeah, that's, I mean, that that was, yeah. that's one of the big things. Um, I wrote, I, I uh, did a video essay, like, two years ago on how awesome Aquaman is from the standpoint of a scientist, a comic fan, and a hydrophobe. And I guess James Wan saw my video. <laughs> because um, the number one thing that I talked about was, um, how can I put this? The definition of monster mm-hmm. is deadly animal that we haven't named yet. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. really what it was. That's pretty accurate. And if you don't believe me, ask the Romans. We can head back in time, <laughs> talk to Hamilcar Barca, and say, you know what? What do you call that thing? Oh, that big gray thing with the giant tree trunk that's coming out of its supposed face with the spears coming out from under what I think are its eyes and those giant flaps of we hope its skin that's coming out of the mist to stomp on our armies making big old noises. That's a monster. I'm like, no, it's an elephant. That thing yeah. is adorable. Look at all that. No, no, it was a monster back then. Yep. It can be a monster now. And if you've ever stared down a tiger or an angry dog, <laughs> you know, yeah. then you, you get the sense of monster. Yeah. So the ocean is filled with stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Just filled with it. Yeah. Recently, and, uh, in an effort to uh, help lull my daughter to sleep on some nights, we've been watching the uh, the Blue Planet series on Netflix, <laughs> which is, you know... The best 
game for Oculus Rift, by the way. Really? It's not even a game. It just plunks you down oh, at the bottom of the ocean. That's exactly what I want. And you just look around going, yep, I would so want to live here as long as it's virtual because that's scary and that's yep. scary and that's scary. I mean, that's that's basically the entire premise of the Subnautica video game, by yeah. the way, which is a, <laughs> one of my favorite games I've ever played. It's just, it's outstanding. But mm-hmm. anyway, that, that's getting off topic. And yeah. uh, as, as we meander around not game topics, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, hey, it's the first segment, man. It's that's true. What that's this true. is for. That's true. <laughs> You know, keep going, keep going. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, like, uh, yeah, that part of what I love about that game is exactly what you just described. And people have said, likewise, that Subnautica is an outstanding game to play in a virtual reality system for the same reason. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, all right, well, you're underwater. M- move around. There's fish everywhere. You you need to eat, so you need to catch some of these fish. And you you need to, like, drink, so you got to figure out how to purify water when you're underwater. Have fun with that. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, you need to breathe air, and uh, there's no land. So... You got some problems you gotta solve, yeah. and just you get to be underwater in beautiful coral reefs, and you know because it's an alien world, there's right. you know crazy you know giant fungal forests underwater and glowing orbs, and it's outstanding. And that's kind of what this movie plays on because. Are you sure it's an alien world? Mm-hmm. It could just be Earth because we don't know what's down there. Right. And they, they make that very clear. Like, you know, they there's even a line in the movie during that scene from the commercial where they're like, we've got more detailed maps of Mars than we do of the ocean floor. Yep. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no that's there. Um, and it's interesting. I had a big complaint with the main... Um, the main um, race of the Atlanteans because mm-hmm. they show... Seven tribes of Atlanteans and dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, they they show, like, there's a moment where you get to see the Atlantean armor because um, the main kingdom of Atlantis, where Aquaman is essentially from, <coughs> um, um, they are the technologically advanced ones, and they're like, yeah, look at all that stuff. But, again, the movie pulls no punches with what it is if you want a gun if you want a plasma rifle whose ammunition is seawater because it turns seawater into plasma to shoot out of a gun you got it um you want okay you want people in armor that really looks like it's made out of plastic but it's something else you got it um you want a whole bunch of people walking around with forks you got it you want giant monsters you got it Although there is one moment, one moment that they were trying to go for, uh, there were a lot of moments where they were trying to go for serious. Mm -hmm. Um, But it didn't go as far off the rails as, say, Big Trouble in Little China as a horror movie. (laughs) But it had that underlying feel of, dude, we know why we're here kind of thing. And the veteran actors that are in this, there are three people that have been acting for longer than 20 years. And that was Nicole Kidman, Willem Dafoe, and Dolph Lundgren. Okay. And you could tell they were the veterans because they were doing their jobs, mm-hmm. and they weren't great, but they were better than everyone else. <laughs> and everyone else was trying. Yeah. And they were trying and trying. And you're just kind of going, dude, stop trying. Yeah. Stop trying. Use a contraction. But then there's Jason Momoa, mm-hmm. who is Mr. Hey, I know why I'm here. Yeah. How you doing? I'm Jason Momoa. Yep. I like rock climbing. Yep. You know. <laughs> I'm a pretty dude, and I'm awesome, so here we are. Like, yeah. Let's do it. So essentially, they turned Aquaman into like a biker that likes getting drunk with his dad that's thrown into the hero's journey. And I'm yeah. like, okay. that Okay. Um, I D- think Different the, take on it, but sure. Uh, no, no it, when I say they turned him into a biker, he never rides a bike. Well, no, I know, but, I know what you mean, though. Like, the, the concept of what goes into being a biker. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah. you look at him, and you're like, why weren't you on Sons of Anarchy? Oh, yeah, because you would have been the straw that broke the camel's back for every single average man ever watching that yeah. show. Yeah. Because, you know. Hey, we understand the male gaze. Like, you know, yeah. a, a lot of a lot of my female fans are like, oh, my God, they always have these idealized women in comic books and cartoons and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, dude, I understand. I put on an episode of Sons of Anarchy or Mad Men with, <clears throat> you know, John Hamm and everything. And it's mm-hmm. like, that's an average guy doing what none of us will ever do. Yep. And look at every man on this show. Yep. 
you know what? I don't feel bad enough about myself, so let me just watch Grey's Anatomy and everything CW. Yeah. I never thought I would think I was an ugly man when just, compared to Jughead. Yeah, the <laughs> the, uh, the beautiful people channel. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. No, it, it's uh, pretty accurate that you, you get a lot of these shows, and everyone kind of knows that Hollywood is making people look prettier or presenting a prettier version of people because you you know, it's just not a lot of ugly people that get put on screen. But at the same time, it just skews the entire perception where average is so far removed from average right, you that know. You, you have no concept. So the pretty people that are supposed to be the pretty people on a show where the average person is prettier than, like, a regular pretty person most of the time, it's like, good grief, you people. Yeah, as I learned in high school, um, TV ugly is still out of my league. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? And it's like, oh, she's got the glasses and the ponytail. Well, she just has those, to take the glasses and, 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 off and, and, yeah, let the no, ponytail down. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, you know, oh. Like <laughs> you know, and, and the overalls, like, oh, God, I could never, oh, my God, she's terrible. And then someone, you know, does yeah. exactly that joke. Yeah. And it's like, she's hot. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's, although, I did know a lot of people like that in school. I really did. I could I could show you pictures of um my friend who so reminds me now of Missy from um from Big Mouth. Okay. <clears throat> Just the awkward black girl with the glasses. Whose voice is kinda like this and everything that she says yeah. kinda sounds like this this is how she should be saying it. Yeah, she's a runway model now. <laughs> yeah. There's it it never ceases to amaze me seeing like my favorite one being uh, the the actor who played Neville Longbottom in the Harry Potter movies. Oh, right! <laughs> like such a such like a goofball kid with buck teeth. He was like, oh, what a goober! And then like by the time the last couple of movies happened, they had to actively ug him up a bit because he was so out of character with how hot he got when he grew up. Yeah, like they had to actively like like put makeup and stuff to make him look less good because this character's not supposed to be that hot. Yeah, because, you know, he starts out looking like this. Where yeah, we're, yeah. You yeah, tell like, okay, like, he's a yeah. goofball kid. Yeah. Like, and it's know. like, oh, that, yeah. that poor guy, you know. <laughs> that poor guy, and then he's, yeah, he's going through all that stuff, and then you know, yeah. By the then, by, the end of the show, by the end of the Harry Potter movies, like, yeah, it's like, hey, oh, oh, how hey, you uh, doing? You know, yeah, that's you, uh, yeah. for you guys on Sound uh, for you guys on SoundCloud, we're looking up pictures of uh, Matthew Lewis, the yeah. dude who played Neville Longbottom, and y'all guys know because Harry Potter is the Star Wars for your generation. So, I mean, Matthew Radcliffe, you know, you were Daniel you're Radcliffe. totally gonna be all right, Daniel Radcliffe. Um, yeah, you were like, oh, okay, yeah, he's a guy, yeah, 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 like yeah. That. and then yeah. by the time he gets grown up. The dude is just like, hi, I'm Daniel Radcliffe, right? And I had an extension, <laughs> and and yep. it's like, you know what? The only reason I don't get so mad about that is because one, my job is to be charismatic <laughs> on the internet that has much lower standards than twenty eight dollars a ticket, True. and second, I don't have an army of personal trainers, makeup yep. artists editors yep. and photoshoppers <laughs> to make me look like Idris Elba. Yep. <laughs> um, I just look like Idris Elba naturally. Ah. Don't touch me. Don't ever touch me. Don't at me. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. They can at me because they're like, you don't look like Idris Elba. You're right. I look like what Idris Elba was supposed to look like before the deal with the devil. Ah, that, that's the there we thing. go. There we go. You know. <sighs> beautiful, so, yeah. beautiful man. Right, right. Oh, God. <sighs> but hey, mm -hmm. I'm excited to talk about games. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to talk about games now since I don't really want to look at myself and I have to look at some of these... Um, since I have to look at the footage as we're filming it, like mm. I'm looking at myself now, going, "Yeah, I shouldn't have talked about that. <laughs> I should." Ah, uh, uh, you pretty guy. You know, yeah, pretty something. Hey, <laughs> zing! But that's okay, because you know, looks aren't everything. It's looks true. Looks aren't everything. Um, um, so. But yeah, we were we were talking about um, this entire type of game, the the concept of a legacy game. Yes, legacy I, games. I I have had the uh, the exciting honor of being able to play a full game of Risk Legacy, mm. um, which uh, was quite so an ordeal. So that's where you were in 2016. <laughs> uh, it was yes 20. Uh, it took about two years for us to get through it because in the middle one of the players had a kid, and was like, well. I guess we wait <laughs> till you're free again because we, we had committed as a group the same five <laughs> players were going to play through the entire game. 
And the way Risk Legacy is set up is uh, the game changes every game, or I should say can change every game for 15 games, after which the game becomes you know static as it is. And you could theoretically keep playing on that Risk board, but at that point the, the main appeal of the game is gone. But what makes a Legacy game, including Risk Legacy, so exciting is every time you're playing, the game changes. You have factions that gain rules. The rule book actually has blank spots where you can add new rules as you do things. And the whole box is full of card sleeves and stuff that are, you know, open this when one player has accumulated 10 armies or one player has, you know. So when you reach basically like the achievement unlocked thing in mm -hmm. video games. Yeah. When you meet these achievements, you open up new cards and new uh, rules, and suddenly the game keeps changing. You put stickers on the board that um, that will affect the the state of the board. Like maybe there's an ammo shortage in this territory, which makes it harder to defend. Right. Or maybe there's radiation in this territory that slowly kills off any armies that are left there. Or you know, all kinds of stuff like that. It's awesome, but uh, <laughs> it's also a commitment that is difficult to do but it's something that anyone who has played especially war games has always kind of wanted to get in on and anyone who's played role playing games probably has had an experience with is the idea that whatever you do in a game is going to carry forward your actions have consequences long term right because everyone kind of likes that you know where if you're just playing a one off game you whatever I'm just going to run headlong into the monster den who cares it's all going to yeah, Leroy Jenkins. Uh, <laughs> oh, but, I didn't think that went all the way through. <laughs> yeah. But when you when you suddenly have to worry, like, well, if I die, this character is just gone, and I lose all the progress and equipment and gear and everything else, suddenly it matters a lot more what you do right. and how you approach it. You know, in a war consequences. game... Consequences. Consequences. Yeah. You know, in a war game, if you... <clears throat> fight with the intent of like well this is just a one off game sure I'll throw my my army at the enemy and maybe they'll all die and who cares but suddenly if you're like no 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 I have to pay to replace these troops for the next game so maybe I want to play a little more conservatively and you know try to uh, have some tactical reserves and try to like pull my punches a little bit more so maybe I do less damage but I'm going to take a lot less on the return you know so it changes the entire way you approach a game. And these legacy games play off that mentality to be able to do stuff like, in the Risk games, mm -hmm. uh, or I should say the Risk Legacy game, um, you approach your entire faction like, okay, this faction is going to have rules that affect it going forward. Every time I win, every time I do this, or if I lose, or the, I'm going to affect the entire world for every game after. How do I want to approach that? Right. Yeah. Right. No, so. <clears throat> I mean, honestly, that is that is a really, really big thing that um, I notice a lot of board games since about the turn of the century started bringing in as more of a standard dynamic. You have games like Risk Legacy, mm -hmm. Arkham Horror, yeah. uh, one of my favorites, um, When Darkness Comes, yep. i.e. most games where you have to create something. Yeah. Um, Zombicide and, of course, um, Pandemic. Yes. Um, both amazing, amazing examples of this. Um, I guess, like, I'm seeing the pitch meeting in my head where mm -hmm. it's like, we should design a game, but it should be a game that takes eight years to play. But how <laughs> can we keep people interested for the entirety of their childhood in one game? Yeah. And the answer is, um, make it a plot. So what I can see is they borrow a lot from tabletop RPGs. Yes. In the sense of um step 1, give the players personal stakes. Yep. Step cuz as long as they have personal stakes, they have investment. 2, give them something to remember when they go home. Yeah. And step 3, give them something to look forward to coming back to. Yep. And that is where the real legacy games like Risk Legacy, Arkham Horror, mm -hmm. um God, what what are some other good examples? Oh, go Zombie Side, Pandemic, mm -hmm. um, all these games that are like, okay, we are going to put something out that has long stakes. Um, um, pandemic is a great example. A great example. Yeah, not, the, the not Pandemic, pandemic Legacy, like the zombie games. The zombie games were like the zombies are kind of taking over the world, and you oh, have to manage mm -hmm. resources and yes. things like that. And it's like, cool, we survived another night at the board game table. Yes, you know. 
um, take pictures of the board, take notes, do all that <laughs> stuff, and I'll see you guys next Sunday, you know, yeah. type of thing. And um, that is, <clears throat> you know, once Risk got, got their hands on it, they're like, oh, we can do this. Yeah. Well, the, the we story behind that, um, the designer that ended up making Risk Legacy, um, the whole story and how we went about this was he had this grand idea about this, that, you know, much like you said, give people personal stakes. Uh, part of the key formula for this was to make – uh, a, a number of irreversible decisions over the course of the game. Yes. Um, so it'll be like, you have two choices, and eat what the choice you choose, peel a sticker off and place it on your card. That is now a new rule for you. Rip the other one up and throw it away. That is out <laughs> of the game. You will, like Your game of Risk Legacy will be different from everyone else's because everyone makes these choices that are irreversible, and you just move forward. Yeah. And so he, again, you know, talking about that pitch meeting, like that, they kind of did it on risk because they considered it a pretty low, well, a low risk game. Ah, ah. <laughs> but um, it was like, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Like people already don't hold risk in the highest regard, like, you know, whatever. We'll, we'll give it a shot. And so he did it and the game is out. Like, I'm not a huge fan of risk. I actually don't like risk very much. Really? Yeah. It's, it, um... Is it the randomness of the combat mechanic or what? It's a lot of the game mechanics are not good, and the game usually ends up. Or is it because you can't hold on to Asia? No, no, no. I never tried to land. Never, never get involved in a land war in Asia. (laughs) No, I I, I don't Mm -hmm. don't ever bother with Asia. Um, (laughs) But uh, no, the problem I always have with Risk is that the game mechanics tend to push a couple of people out of the game and then have two or three people grind for hours with nothing fun happening. Okay. So Risk Legacy fixes that entire mechanic in game one. And what it is is you win the game by getting four victory points. You get a, you start the game, uh, if you've never won a game before, you start the game with a victory point. And then you get one victory point for every capital you control, including your own. So you start the game with two victory points. You need to capture two other players' capitals out of the five total, including yourself. Right. Once you do, you win the game. So you can make a big push and do it, and you can win. And it means that when we played our first day of this game, we Mm -hmm. played four rounds of Risk Legacy in a single game session. Because the games lasted like an hour or less, because we would like get down, play some Risk, and then like somebody would like get all, you know, build a big army, do a big push, and win. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we're done. Let's yeah. let's do it again. Hey, why not? And so we we played for about five or six hours, and we got like four rounds of risk in in the same. And you know, again, each game was changing it up. So this idea of like it's going to take eight years to play is not really as accurate when you're like, okay, we got we can we can do the first few games in a session. You know, by the time we were doing the end of the game, it was like two games of risk per gaming session. But mm-hmm. still, like that's still quite a bit compared to what most people think of when they play <clears throat> Risk. Yeah. Or um, most of the games from Hasbro now mm-hmm. um, that aren't the standard Monopoly, sorry, um, yeah, you know, or like um, I used to call them the Target games, but Target is expanding. expanding yeah, on. I know what you so mean. We'll though, call them the thin boxes. There you thin go, thin, box, thin box games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is that is an interesting an interesting take to look at these things now. Yeah. Um, We'll get back to the next point I was thinking after we talk about a couple of more games, but we're, yes. we're going to get there. Um, interesting thing happened. Mm-hmm. Um, we ended up getting another another board game, okay? And this is a licensed board game, so okay. you gotta love licensed game. Um, as you guys know, I'm kind of dating someone who's not a hobbit. She's absolutely not a hobbit. <clears throat> Though she does love a whole lot of fantasy stuff and a lot of things that are geared toward um, girl marketing and stuff like that. So we ended up getting the Labyrinth board game. I've heard uh, – I haven't played the game yet, but I've heard it's a pretty decent board game. Um, wouldn't know because we sat down to play. We opened the box. We looked at the components. And then we saw the rule book. And oh, I'm like, oh, no. this is going to take some studying. Maybe today isn't the best day. Yeah. Um, One of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well – most board games are those. And, uh, um, not not the good ones, in my opinion. Um, the go on. Well, as you put it, there's a lot of board games where that is the standard. Mm-hmm. Where you know you open it up and you have to spend like there needs to be at least one person who has spent probably an hour or more studying the rule book, literally studying it mm-hmm. to be able to understand the rules to teach everyone else. 
because the game is just too dense to do otherwise. Yeah. Um, the a lot of the really good games that I've been seeing lately are games that have a rule set that is intuitive enough that it doesn't require that. Or it's intuitive enough that you can learn all together all at once. You don't need to have somebody study this rule book. Well, um, I don't know if Labyrinth is that kind of game. Okay. But what I do know is that the players I was with are those players. Ah, yeah. Okay? And this is this is an important this is an important aside um, for today's show because there is I know I talk a lot about tournament players and sure, the tournament sure. player te- um, mentality. And you guys are welcome here. Make no mistake. I like tournament players. Um, but there is a... What is the term I'm looking for? There is a particular mindset um, about when when to and when not to be competitive. Yeah. And a lot yeah. of people can't turn that off. Yeah. What they end up doing, and it, it's not a character flaw or anything like that. It's just a matter of, we talk a lot about knowing your audience. Yeah. Know your gaming group and stuff like that. And when there are people that are just dead set on winning the game every time their first time, yeah, somebody has to be that guy. That, that guy that knows every single rule and yeah. every single loophole. Because if a person is trying to win more than they're trying to learn the rules... That kind of makes for an off-balance session. Well, usually um, what ends up happening in my experience is they will start to uh, use rules incorrectly and then get very upset and defensive when they are called out on that. Ding, 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 ding. Or they start getting frustrated and I don't want to say hostile, but I will say aggressive hmm. when they get really, really like you know, that that circumstance that you're talking about where mm-hmm. they think they understand a rule, they go for it, and it's like, no, that's not how it works. Yeah. They get defensive, they get aggressive, um, or when they know they just don't understand what's going on, then they start getting mad at themselves yeah. for not being as smart and all that other stuff. And it's like, dude, take a breath. Yeah. It's just a game. Yep. We're just here to play. We're here to have fun. Mm-hmm. It's not a big deal if you don't know the rules or if you lose your first game because we can play again, and we can still have fun losing. Right. Like, so understanding that, um, you know, understanding that um, some players do that intuitively just because it is their formative, it, it, it really is their formative gaming paradigm. Yeah. That's when you have to choose, like, eh, not this time, not that time, yeah. no, 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 not that time. So um, And and there are some games where, it, I always try to make sure at least the rule part, you know, that people understand the rules correctly, but there's some times where I really do appreciate having a cutthroat group. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you you and I both appreciate the Game of Thrones board game very much. Yes, we do. Yeah, we do. And I, will, I wouldn't say I appreciate it, but what I will say is that it gives a good understanding of diplomacy and um, long-term thought. So it's not as mm-hmm. much an appreciation or an admiration, one would say. <laughs> but yes, it's it's. I've been known to smile once or twice while playing Game of Thrones. Yeah, <laughs> and that's... But having, like, you, you can attest, having everyone on the same page for that game and having everyone be ready, like, hey, buddy, <laughs> like, like the, the smile with the knife behind the back, Everyone on the same page of that? I did tell you not to trust me. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) That is the most fun I've ever had playing that game is like, look, we are all here to wreck (laughs) each other. We are just going to just, we're going to smile and then I'm going to tell you that we're friends and I'm going to ally with you and just like (laughs) invade you. Oh, it's going to be great. We're going to have so much fun. And 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 that tends to come out in the third or fourth gaming session where yes. everyone understands the rules. Yes. It's just yes. like, I, I do recall there was a time I was trying to teach someone Flux. Mm. Ooh, that is yeah. one of the easiest games to teach because how hard is it to say RTFC? Yep. You know, <laughs> read the foremost card. Uh-huh. That's how you play. I bet yeah, you guys yeah, thought I wasn't yeah, going, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, and they were just like, no! And I'm like, Okay, I'm just going to put this game away, and I guess uh, maybe we can try something with a less steep learning curve, you know? Um, less steep learning, card, learning curve than Flux. They're okay. out there. Yeah, yeah they're no, out there. I'm just saying that's, that, that's getting kind of more towards the bottom of that curve. No, but, no, yeah. no, no, no. It, again, circumstances, context okay. determines me. All right, all right. Okay, like I said, I don't want to say that a lot of these games are bad. 
It's just a matter because I don't believe that there are such things as bad games yeah, unless they're just that. totally terrible. Like uh, I found a game 20 years ago about being a smoker is bad. And if you're a smoker, you're going to lose. You're going to lose your life. You're going to lose your friends. You're going to lose in everything. And that's what this game shows. And I'm like, well, that sucks. I guess it's a good game for people that hate smokers. So yeah. that's the whole thing. So well, and, and some games are thing. intentionally designed to be bad. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one famous example of a uh, one of the old historical war game board games. You know, the, the are you talking about ones. the Tet Offensive? No, not the Tet Offensive. <laughs> the um, I can't remember the name of the game, but it's it's a World War II game in North Africa, like to try and and it's it's so unnecessarily granular to the point of not being fun. The guy who created it didn't intend for it to ever be played. It was basically an art project for him to show how unfun a game can be when you get this granular about it. Mm. And I, I can't remember the name of it offhand, but like you have to keep track of like the water rations for your troops. But if you're Italian, then or if you're playing the Italian troops, then you go through a slightly higher amount of water because they have to boil their pasta in it. And no, I'm just like it's ridiculous. That was so racist. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it's it's become a joke in the game. You you have your macaroni wa- ration that you you have to just account for the fact that the Italians go through more water, and so you know it, it's that level of unnecessarily granular. Okay. And his point is that this is not supposed to be fun. This is supposed to show how a game can be bad. That being said, a lot of people now take that as a challenge and like, <laughs> how can we play through this entire ridiculous game? I, I do know yeah. quite a few people that are going, no, that that's great. That's yeah. simulation because I am smart enough to run an entire army. Yeah. Uh, mm, and know? there's there's absolutely an appeal to that, but I think you just hit on a good point is that there's not necessarily a bad game. It's just not all games are for everyone. Aha. Uh-huh. Ah. Aha. Uh-huh. Um, You know, like looping back around on the legacy game thing, one of the other ones that we talked about that's a really big gorilla on the block right now is called Gloomhaven. Yes. And Gloomhaven is a fantasy legacy style game. And it is, uh, to put it in the best possible terms, a heavy game. We're talking about thin box games. This is about as thick of a game as you can get. You know, T-I- or T-H-I-C-C, mm-hmm. you know, thick game. Yeah, and I mean, the box itself is about seven inches tall. Yeah, it's huge, and it's heavy. That thing is a brick. <laughs> um, but what comes in that box is a, it's like a, it's a role-playing game in a box. Mm-hmm. You you get a character, and this character is going to level up, and you, this character is eventually going to retire, and then that character that retired that was yours now becomes an NPC that you can now buy gear from that is going to make all the rest of the playthrough different or better because now there's more gear available, and you fight monsters, and maybe you cleared out this dungeon, but now you have to go back later because something else has populated it, and the world is persistent, and the characters matter. The decisions that you make and the way you play the game is going to continue to have an effect on all future games. Mm -hmm. So I've got some friends who've played this. I have not had the honor of playing Gloomhaven yet. I very (laughs) much want to. Um, But, yeah, the the idea that they have this long-running game for, like, a couple... like Because the friend who who was hosting it, he got the game on Kickstarter. um, Because originally Gloomhaven was a Kickstarter. Ah, Kickstarter. Yeah. It's the Amazon of the future. Like, literally, you buy stuff for the future it might come out it might not come yeah. out but honestly you're going i am going to love that in a year and a half yeah <laughs> it's, it's a weird I, I i got issues on that but um anyway he he picked it up and it was about you know a third of the, the store price because this is not a cheap board game right uh so it was about a third of the store price i think when he got it um and they have played a zillion hours of this game and they haven't remotely run out of content for it because you just keep playing your character has a goal and you need to meet certain conditions to be able to like move up your character's rank and everything and so you just show up you play your dude and you go basically do some dungeon crawls and the whole world changes every time you do the loot that you get from the dungeon you sell which affects the economy of this st- oh it's ridiculous 
but in the best, coolest way. <laughs> like, you know, the, the, the you, you've talked on the show a number of times about mm-hmm. how, as a DM, you like to show the players the consequences of their actions when they, you know, pull all the gold out of a tomb and tank the local economy. Yep. <laughs> yeah. This is, it, it's going to be maybe not quite that draconian, but it is going to hey. show. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Not to say that that uh, that's bad, but it, it can lead to a negative play experience. But this still shows that the idea that your actions are going to affect the other players and the world and the entire way you buy things and get new equipment going forward, that's a big deal. Okay. All right. So. I just, you know. Yeah. Uh, draconian is kind of a trigger word. I'm just saying. Oh, like, okay. Hey, I'm not, I'm not that guy. Uh, okay. Okay. You know, okay, I am kind of that guy. <laughs> I'm trying not to be that guy in a bad way. Okay, just just bad way. Um, so yeah, so I mean these these types of legacy games and stuff like that, um, they have their ups and downs. Yeah. And this is actually going to lead into our next segment because you're looking at a game such as Risk Legacy. Now, yeah. Let's not lie. That thing is sixty five to seventy five dollars. Yep. You know, so that is like, oh my god, that's yeah. They're pricier <clears throat> than normal board games. Yes, they're, yeah. Well, normal board games um, are now like thirty-five to sixty dollars. Yeah, so. I think te- <clears throat> like I I typically assume that forty dollars is a a standard board game price. Sixty dollars is a premium board game price. Right, right. So this yeah. is this is in that realm of premium board game. So it's like, well, you're doing this, and you play through the legacy thing. And then your game is stuck from all the stickers and all the ripping mm-hmm. up. But that's where we start talking about relative costs. Mm-hmm. Because, how can I put it? A friend of mine got me Game of Thrones, um, God, five years ago mm-hmm. when it was $35. Okay, mm-hmm. just that was it. $35, Game of Thrones. Um, I got Settlers of Catan 15 years ago when it was like $35. Yeah. For the board game and twenty dollars for each expansion, and I was working at a game store, so I got the huge <laughs> yeah, discount yeah. and all that stuff. And it's like you're looking at things like this, and you're going sixty-five dollars, good lord! <laughs> but let's really examine that. Oh, let's yeah. really, really examine that. Um, you're paying the sixty-five to seventy-five dollars for something like Gloomhaven, or uh, Gloomhaven is like one hundred and ten. Yeah, I was gonna say Gloomhaven is probably one hundred and twenty to one hundred and forty, you know, um, something like that. But you you pay like the seventy five dollars for Risk Legacy and stuff like that, and you go, oh good lord, blah blah blah, for a game that I'm gonna be marking up on and all that stuff. Look, I'm talking to you guys out there. Let's be real. I've had Game of Thrones on my shelf for five years. I play it maybe twice a year, maybe when I can get people that are that are at my place that are sober enough to think clearly mm-hmm. and that you know would really actually like to do that. Um, when was the last time you pulled out Monopoly? Seriously, mm-hmm. the last time you actually pulled one of these games off your shelf. Um, and this comes down to, um, you know, um, this is something that really comes down to perceived value versus act versus observable value. Um, I've had games on my shelf for years Mm -hmm. that I just haven't gotten around to opening yet because life gets in the way. Oh yeah. So if you get if you pay the sixty five, seventy dollars for a game like this, okay, and um and you end up playing it one time and you do all that marking. Now that one time can last a month. Like if you're meeting weekly or every other week or something like that. It can last a while. The question is, how much gameplay do you get out of this expensive one? Versus how much gameplay you 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 get <clears throat> out of the games that have already been on your se- shelf yeah. forever, you know. Which that's... when when we were talking about playing Risk Legacy, the group that ended up getting together to play it, that was actually one of the things that we discussed specifically was mm-hmm. like, you know, because part of the pitch right off the bat is like, hey, here's this game that you can play through 15 times, and then you basically can't play it anymore. This game is now defunct. <laughs> and so we had to have a talk with ourselves like, okay, well, do we want to spend money on a game that has a guaranteed you cannot play it after this point? And the conclusion we came to was, when was the last time you played any board game in your collection 15 times? <laughs> any game. Exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, if you played through any game 15 times and threw it away, you would probably have a good run with that game. Yeah, that's that's a huge, huge part. I mean, 
I personally can say I've done it because I've played, um, well, 15 times. Yeah, I can personally say I've done it yeah. because grew up poor. So, well, you know, we end up playing the same game over and over and over. But And, and if you have a favorite game, like maybe you love Settlers of Catan and that's mm-hmm. like your standard, we're going to drink wine and play Settlers Night. You might play that game a ton. But the point is, most board games, especially when we get into that premium board game price, it seems, uh-huh. like, it seems like the more premium the board game, the less it gets played. But <laughs> uh, again, it's so true. I, I, think, <laughs> I personally think that has to do with that idea of the thick rule book and how difficult it is to get new people to play. But I feel like that's another topic. Um, but yeah, the idea, like, if you play through any game that many times, you're probably getting your money's worth out of it at least. Well, yeah. Um, because, again, we're talking value for money, yeah. right? Um, you divide 65 by 15, mm-hmm. and you're going to get more than three. Yeah. Okay, more, or you're going to get 65 by 15 is 2.0333333 point, um, 2. something, okay? Um, shut up with your calculators. Um, anyway, <clears throat> yeah, I got Google too, but I'm trying to use my head because, you know, wizard. <laughs> um, but... You get 2.3333333, right? Yeah. That equals two people going to the movies. Oh, yeah. You know, two people going to the movies. Like, I go to the movies twice. My girl goes to the movies twice. We've paid for a board game. Easily. So if you get 15 uses for the same price, proportionally, that you pay for a movie, and each use takes two to three times the length of a movie. Yeah. What value are you actually getting? Oh, huge value. You and know? that's that we, we've talked a little bit on the show about that idea of value for money before, but that's always a huge calculation for me when it comes to board games, video games, and miniatures games. Yeah, you're getting poor. <laughs> Welcome well, no, back it, to our economic state. I, I'm just saying this has always been a thing. When I look at a at a new game, I look at something like Warhammer, which is everyone considers a very expensive hobby. But I look at it and I go, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pay I don't know, 60 bucks. I'm going to get a bunch of these miniatures. Then I'm going to spend a zillion hours painting them. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to enjoy that. And I'm going to spend a bunch of time looking at them and go, oh, those are really cool. I'm going to put those models on the table with my friends. I'm going to play games. And those games are going to be fun. And I'm going to have a, like so many hours of entertainment for this money. And again, mm-hmm. I always use the movies as that as that benchmark because yeah. that's the thing nobody ever thinks about or, or like – Nobody ever boxed oh, well, the idea of going to the movies. People think about it. They just accept it. Okay. You know? Yeah. But they yeah, they don't balk the idea of paying $15 to go to the movies. They might grumble about it, but people still do it. So, yeah. It's like, okay, $15 is a movie ticket. Can I get a good video game for $15? Uh, yeah. I can jump on Steam. I can get a great video game for $5. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, $5 I consider the sandwich price. Okay. Like, you know, I can go without a sandwich for a day and, okay. you know, and get a, and get a nice video game maybe. The, the, the sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. In terms of what I give up. You know, if I'm going to give up, you know, a sandwich is a couple of minutes of inter- you know, mm-hmm. entertainment. So if I can get a few hours, <laughs> a few hours of entertainment out of a cheap video game. Sorry. You say a couple of, a couple of minutes of entertainment from a sandwich. And you, oh, I'm, I'm very entertained by that sandwich. sandwich. Oh, yeah. I want to be in your belly. <laughs> you <know. laughs> yeah. Like I, I, uh, I, I enjoy a sandwich for a few minutes. I enjoy a movie for a few hours. I can enjoy a board game like we talked about, mm-hmm. you know, especially a game like Risk Legacy. I enjoyed that game for many hours, several times, you know, in several sessions for many hours at a time mm-hmm. over the course of two years. Yeah. Like I got to hang out with my friends. It was a huge experience. And that was like, yeah, it was like 50 bucks, 60 bucks, something like that. And, uh, yeah, that that is a really good return on investment. Yeah. Um, and a lot of good board games, especially if you get a committed group, can be that. And even Gloomhaven, that is a very high price point. <laughs> if you have a group that's actually going to be dedicated to sitting down, you're going to get far better return on investment playing this ridiculously expensive but also ridiculously deep game than you are playing Monopoly. Right. So... Um so I mean, again, this is this is a decent thing on the investment. Now, on that note, mm-hmm. let's go to the opposite end of that yeah. spectrum. Yeah. Okay. Um, we picked up um, a couple of games that I haven't had a chance to play yet. Like okay. We were trying, but yeah, life happens. Um, and yeah, I want to talk about um, exit colon. Yeah. The escape room um, things. Now, these games are interesting. They're very interesting. 
because if you don't know what you're getting into, um, you got Chris Rock in your head when you pay for it. You know, you got, oh, 25 bucks for a game. All right, cool. Then you open up the rules and it's like, whoa, blah, blah, blah. All right, now you're going to rip this up. Now you're going to throw mm-hmm. this. You're going to throw it in trash. It's like, wait, rip up my game components. Good Lord. I paid $25 <laughs> for this. You know, and yeah, um, and yeah this is um, Exit from Cosmos Games. And it's an escape room. Mm-hmm. And it's a one-time use game. Yeah. One-time use for two to five players. Yeah. And um, Which I, I you pitched this to me. And I was fascinated by it because at first I was like a one time use, and I had to think about that exact conversation I just mentioned about mm-hmm. about the Risk Legacy game, where it's like, hang on, how much entertainment am I getting out of this this f- limited use thing? And this is an extreme example of one time. Yeah. But tell me, tell me, Solar. Yeah. How, what do you get? How much does one time cost for this game? Well, honestly, the one time cost of this game is a couple of hours. However, you got four players. All right. Four players four for players, about, what, they're two playing hours? $6. Because if you're all throwing your kitty, oh, you all okay. throw in the money for the kitty, okay? You all throw yeah. into the kitty. So everybody's paying five or six bucks for a night of gaming, right? And the whole gig, and the reason I haven't actually put a lot of passion into this is because I hate escape rooms. Ah, I, I don't okay. like escape rooms. Um, I don't like the idea of I'm so clever. I'm going to look for the meat picture in the in yeah. the top left corner of the room that I'm looking around in three dimensions. And um, again, most of my gaming groups are very competitive. Mm-hmm. We're not very team oriented, which is why I'm trying to get my hands on more co-op games. Yeah. Um, so you know, you get that. I'm going to get out of here and all that stuff. Don't get me wrong. I love watching escape room games Mm -hmm. you know the cube was one of my favorite um one of my favorite indie films because i'm like yep 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 they're just going back oh my god the dude with the disability is the one yeah spoilers but it's 12 years old so you know statute of limitations is a little past yeah exactly it's like oh the dude with the disability is the one that got out that was kind of cool i i kind of i i kind of do that um but yeah but i don't want to be one of those people (laughs) <laughs> I just I, I don't want to be one of those people, yeah. but yeah. So no, escape, I, I, I get what yeah. you mean though. Like the the escape room can be frustrating to be a part of, mm-hmm. but ultimately it's it's a puzzle game. Yes. And if you're able to do a puzzle game, but you're able to get everybody on that same mindset of working together and not trying, like you say, being competitive about it, like and for you know a cheap price that you can play in your home while you're sipping on some wine or something. Hey. This escape or uh, exit the game sounded pretty good to me so far. Yeah, exactly. So it's like um, there are so far six or seven different um, versions. As a matter That's of fact, good. the first one I pulled up was a trilogy, as a matter of fact. It was a trilogy of exit. So that was kind of neat. Yeah. Um, and and do, you, do, yeah. do they have like deals where if you buy several copies of it, it's a little bit cheaper per copy? Or That's down to the store, dude. Okay. That, that's all down to the I store. I just didn't know the pricing model for yeah, it. No, <clears throat> no that, that is a store decision. Okay. It really is. Um, nothing from the company has come out yet, but again, you know, it's one of those, <laughs> it's really one of those, you know, buy it, escape, good job. Yeah. Um, and again reading the rules and all that stuff that is something you either have to do so that you know Mm -hmm. like everybody on the board or everybody in the game knows all the rules um or no one reads the rules and everyone fumbles through while trying to figure out you know it's 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 a weird thing so we haven't actually gone through all that stuff yet but the day is coming the day is coming well I'll tell you what Um, I really like about the the concept of exit the game so far mm -hmm. uh, again having not played it either um the single biggest problem that I run into with games like Risk Legacy or Gloomhaven or whatever is getting a group together to commit to multiple game sessions. Uh-huh. You know, we are adults. Our li- you know, uh-huh. We got kids. We got jobs. Some of us have school. It's just there's a whole life that makes getting a schedule together at any point in time difficult. But Exit the Board Game has that same fun of like, hey, look, we're just going to do a thing. And it's it's a it's a one shot, mm-hmm. but a one shot board game in a different sense because you can always do a board game as play through one time <coughs> and you're done. Right. But this is literally you tear the game up when you're done. And you're, <laughs> yeah, you're, this you're is over it. it. Yeah. yeah. So I love that idea of the commitment is one night, guys, for like two hours. Like you, we can carve two hours out of our schedule at some point. Come on, guys. It doesn't <laughs> have to be a repeat thing. Though it'd be nice if it was. But hey, here we are. Yeah. You know it, it's. 
since you and I um, really come together on that, we're the ones that go. Come on, guys! <laughs> you can, oh, don't give me that too. Uh, how how long were you binge watching YouTube videos of people playing Minecraft? Exactly. Come on, you know. Yeah, I was. I was be with another human being. You know. Yeah. I was. I was joking with my friend the other day. He was going, oh, "I don't have time to paint my miniatures." And I'm like, "Look, dude, I painted like six thousand points of Warhammer over the past like year and a half while juggling like a kid, a full time job, relationships. Like, you can make the time if you care. It's it's about what you're willing to do." Okay, I'm gonna pull you off of that reel right there because uh-huh. I see you going down the Trump path. Oh, and now I'm saying that because of this. Uh, yeah, people say I don't. I didn't have the time. I'm on people about all that stuff all the time, and I'm. Ba- I'm your point. I'm getting. I'm right there with you. Okay. But your presentation of the point goes down the Trump path. Okay. It's not a matter of comparing them to you, because a lot of people go, well, you know, when I was young, I had a job and I I, I was in college and, and, and <clears throat> that loses the point. What I am gonna say is, compare them to themselves. It's like, I didn't have time to paint any miniatures this week. Really? What'd you do? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. How many hours did you spend watching Netflix? Yeah. How long did you spend drinking? So you had the time. You just spent the time on another yeah. thing that you wanted to do. But you had the time. And that was ultimately but, where yeah. I was going with that. So, oh, yeah. 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 That's, that, I, 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 just I see what you mean. You yeah. that, you no, no, no. no. You're, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> the presentation is poor, but the idea is. Is applicable. yes. The idea is you're absolutely right with the idea. Yeah, totally like you, you're using your time in ways that you could better manage it if you wanted to do the thing you say you want to do. Exactly. Yeah. I- exactly. You, you know, if you say you want to make time to hang out with your friends and play board games, what are you doing instead of that? Because we all have the same number of hours in our days, and we all got busy schedules. Right. Right. So. And th- and that's 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 really a big thing. That's this is a lot of people tell me often that I shouldn't be so angry with my friends. And I'm like, no, I am angry with my friends because they're sitting up like, that dude would rather stay at his house and mope than to come out and find a good time with me. I get angry at that, you Mm -hmm. know? Or they would rather go out and do a whole bunch of stuff that I like doing and not tell me that they're doing it than tell me that they don't have time because they're busy. Yeah? Bad presentation. Um, yeah, so, yeah, optics are optics are important. You know, it, yeah. we talk on the show about expectation management and how Bingo. big of a difference it makes for everything in your life. We also haven't talked a lot, but it is, I would say, equally important how things look. You know, the I, I know you're not a big fan of uh, you know people's feelings being in control of things, but ultimately, <laughs> how things look. I'm are, not that kind of monster. <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm just, I'm <laughs> quoting you. you know? uh, but how things look is going to affect how people react to them more than the reality of what's actually going on behind the scenes. Right. You know, and if you look like, you know, if you look like you're screwing around and you're, you know, you're not making time for your friends, your friends are going to go like, what the heck, man? You seem to have a lot of time to watch Netflix, but not a lot of time to hang <laughs> right. out with me. Right. But you say that you have no time to hang out with me, but I don't feel like that's actually the – I feel like you just don't want to. It, you know. Exactly. And they go, well, no, yeah, there's other mitigating factors. And all that. So, okay, well, it looks like the optics are that you're just blowing me off. Yeah, that, that's, you know? that's exactly the whole thing. But speaking – of optics, it looks like we're into the last segment of the show oh, where we yeah. talk about more writing stuff. Oh, yes, yes, that's what we did. So, of course, we've covered the butt, and therefore, yeah, we've covered um, comedy and drama, and where comedy is actually someone else's drama <laughs> that the main characters yeah. do not participate in, yeah, um, because they don't suffer the consequences. So we've talked about that. And today, I was like, what am I going to talk about Mm -hmm. with the writing segment? And it totally hit me. I complain a lot about something. Uh, So Uh, you're going to need to narrow that down. (laughs) You're just full of of sass today. I I am sassy You're just so sassy. Uh, You stop with that sass or I'm going to hit you with a wet sass paper. uh, Um, I'm going to say, all right, Grandpa. The the main thing that I complain about Uh is bathos it's the reason Ah, i don't really like a lot of low budget musical productions Mm -hmm. um i don't really like most of joss whedon's writing because Mm -hmm. it's drowning in bathos 
And what is bathos, Solar? You're using all of these big words that you shouldn't have access to because of, because you grew up somewhere that doesn't have that that good an education system. Well, kids, bathos, boo hoo hoo, um, is I'm trying to pull this up for you guys to watch as well. Um, noun. Especially in a work of literature, an effect of anticlimax created by an unintentional lapse in mood from the sublime to the trivial or ridiculous. What does that mean? It means you mess up the mood. We know bathos as narkill. <laughs> um, as what? Narkills. You Narc. unintentionally change the mood from one thing to its antithesis. Okay. Okay. We see this all the time especially in modern media. Yeah. Um, one of the things I can't stand about Joss Whedon's writing is <clears> that <throat> he's always about cutting the discomfort. Yeah. It's never let you sit in a dramatic moment. It's every I, I often describe a lot of the work, especially the early stuff with Buffy and Angel mm -hmm. and Cabin in the Woods and you know mostly everything he has his, his fingerprint on is <clears throat> the moment something becomes uncomfortable Somebody tells a joke, hmm. okay? And it got to a point with that work and a lot of writing in bathos, or a lot of bathos in writing, where the moment something becomes uncomfortable, be that discomfort, sadness, mm -hmm. disgust, pain, um, anything that gives drama, everyone trips all over themselves to lighten the mood. Yeah. And, it, and the optics on it comes down to everyone just trying to look clever hmm. i'm gonna be clever i'm gonna be funny i'm gonna be funny i'm gonna say the line that everybody remembers no i'm gonna say the line that everybody remembers stop it yeah the story is what's most important okay i mean a yep. great example of bathos not being there um spoilers for game of thrones season seven okay just take a breath actually for yeah yeah season seven i think it's season seven Okay, spoiler. Have you have you been? I, I have, but I feel like that might be pushing it for spoilers for people who, because that was the most recent season. Yeah, yeah. So major spoiler. So do the la 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 thing. Okay, the death of Hodor. Yeah. Was sad as all get out. Yeah. You know, finding out why he says Hodor, looking at what he's doing, realizing the implications of the fact that between the age of thirteen and forty five. He knew when he was going to die, how he was going to die, how painful it was, and all the circumstances that led up to it. Well done. Yeah. And the episode ends. He dies, and the episode ends, and you just got to sit with that. Yep. And it's like, sit with it, feel it, be sad about it. Now, can you imagine Game of Thrones Season 1, as soon as... Ned Stark, um, you know, when, when they kill Ned Stark, that ain't a spoiler, guys. At this point, no. Yeah. You know, when they kill Ned Stark and Sean Bean's head falls on the thing, if freaking, I don't know, King Joffrey Lannister Baratheon went, wah, 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 yeah. you know, that wouldn't have had the same impact. I, I think that you're, you know? the, the show in general does exactly what you're talking about. Like, mm -hmm. you're, you're giving some good specific examples, but I think that we could just kind of cite the entirety of Game <laughs> of Thrones <laughs> yeah. and say, like, yeah, this is a show where something dramatic or bad happens and you just got to sit with it. Yeah. Whatever it is. Maybe it's just like, yeah. That that place burned down now. It's it just gone. Yeah. Like exactly. exactly. Yeah. It's gone. Look at the weeping people. Now I'm not saying um you have to have sadness or tragedy. But with bathos and writing, and this is what a lot of players do, a lot of writers do, um, they try and lean too heavily on bathos because they don't quite get that we need the dark to make the bright brighter. Yeah. Okay, so everyone is rushing to be the one that turns on the lights. Yeah. And then everybody turns on that lamp. And we end up with big trouble in little China. <laughs> um, well, and and getting back to talking about Joss Whedon, um, you know, Buffy was a great show for a lot of things, but exactly what you're talking about, this whole bathos thing, ends up coming off as very campy, which is of course part of the appeal of Buffy. You watch the show because it is campy. And it never feels super serious as a result, which, I mean, you can cite a lot of reasons for that, mainly it being on primetime television. But um, there's a handful of these, like, super dramatic moments in the show that 
actually lets you sit with it for a little bit, but even then, it's just like, oh yeah. man, and like a handful out of eight seasons. Yeah, is not it? it that's well, it, exactly an example. It's not the so, point of the show. So yeah. So when people are writing their gaming campaigns, mm-hmm. um, especially nowadays, because Whedon's writing has done so much influencing, mm-hmm. just like Burton's writing has done so much influencing yeah. on a lot of people. It's just. The nature of the generation. But the reasons the classics stay the classics mm-hmm. is because they know when to add it and when not to add it. Um, a perfect example of well placed bathos, um, which is older than all of us, is in Casablanca, mm. um, where um, the prefect, played by Claude Rains, um, <clears throat> is being corrupt for the Nazis and he's shutting down Rick's place. Because, you know, this was right after the dramatic scene where the Germans are singing the the national anthem of Germany, you know, from the Nazi point of view. And mm-hmm. then everybody else in the bar sings the French national anthem and drowns them out. And they're like, yes, yes. And then the Nazis have, have the police shut the place down. Yeah. Um, and again, that is... The implications of that are insidious. You know, oh, yeah. it's like Nazis are bad. They have all this power. Blah blah blah. They're they're shutting down everything. They're kind of socially attacking the main character of Humphrey Bogart. Mm-hmm. And of course, Claude Rains is like, you know, nope, we're shutting a place down. And Humphrey Bogart is like, why are you shutting my place down? You know, we didn't do anything. And Claude Rains is like, I'm shocked, shocked and appalled that there's gambling happening at this establishment. Without missing a beat, the dude from the roulette table comes out, oh, your winnings prefect. Oh, thank you very much. Shut it down, you know? Yeah. And it's like the bathos was used to show the corruption, mm-hmm. you know, and to cut the tension, but it's serving two purposes, and it's not just there to seem clever, Yeah. which makes it clever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was clever without trying. And, uh, well, it was clever by being itself and not trying to be funny. Um, you remember when I was putting this this place together, and I was talking about putting up the signs yeah. that are up here, and one said, "Do not try to be funny." Yeah, <laughs> you know, don't try to be funny. You know. So my my question to you then. Yes. Um, so we're talking about this from the writing perspective, mainly for writing like role playing game stuff. How do you, as the DM, uh, incorporate the lack of bathos, or specifically incorporate bathos better into your writing? Because obviously. You only have so because it is a cooperative experience. Your yes. players are going to make jokes. They're going to make light of things. There's going to be these moments where you intended something to be dramatic or intense, and your players are just going to poo all over it. So, how do you, as the DM, you leverage this best? Well, Timmy, I'm glad you asked. Ah, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> uh, I'm starting to catch the patter of the show. What can yeah, I say? Hey, fantastic. Uh, it's yeah. almost like it's scripted. <laughs> it isn't. Um, and see, we just did that. That is exactly how we did it. A person tells the joke. That's fine. But yeah. And this is something for you guys out there, especially you younger ones who are like me, um, in the sense of people make fun of you and, you know, the bullying of the 21st century is social and verbal. Answer sarcasm with literacy. Hmm. Okay? Um, when someone says, um, whenever someone is trying to tell a joke to cut the tension, mm-hmm. Make the characters that you're playing as the GM, i.e. the NPCs, stick with the moment. Okay. Okay. So let's give an example. I will be the GM, you be the player. Okay. Okay. And, you know, um, I have tried to, uh, I have come down, um, I have talked to you here now, and I need your group's help to find my daughter who's been captured by the subterranean lobster men. I know um, these men have claws for hands and they breathe underwater and they're known for boiling children and starting to eat eat them from their toes all the way up so that the children die in agony because um, the god that they worship feed off of the screams of children. And my daughter's been taken and I really need your guys' help. It might be a fortnight. Go ahead, tell a joke. Yeah? You got a prefect. Looks like seafood's on the menu tonight. I hope not. This is my daughter. I remember her first steps. She used to look at me and say, Daddy, I like. I want to cut wood like you. And, you know, that would be great. I don't want to eat the enemy. 
I just want my daughter back. Give me some more bathos. I dare you. <laughs> yeah. I dare uh, you. I, I, I can see the, <laughs> yeah. yeah, just like, well, now I feel super awkward about that, so we're just, we're, we're going to go to the thing now. Yeah, yeah mm. exactly. Yeah. And if the drama is proper, the bathos can be used to really, really accentuate the drama of the scene because it's, hey, it looks like seafood's on the menu tonight. This is a joke to you? Yeah. Oh, well, I... I uh, <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> yeah. What? I, I, I didn't mean to... It was not It was just kind of... It was real tense, and I just... And that gives the leader gonna, of the party the chance to be like, you failed. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and again, throw those consequences on there. Did they make an enemy? Did they make a friend with the... Thank you for trying to make me laugh, because, you know, I understand that you see the seriousness of me losing my child, but I, I really appreciate it. You're a good jester. Right. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. <clears throat> but you just make that, you make the drama of this, you take their attempt at bathos, mm -hmm. and you just power through it, even if you have to use that whole thing. Um, oh my god, NP City is talking like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you, Khan. Um, Khan was one of the players that we had in the weekly one shot, the ah, first episode. Nice. And yeah, um, <clears throat> you know, they tried to hit with Bathos. They, okay. they really did. And I showed this and think it's in the archive. Go check it out, guys. <laughs> um, and it was like, well, we're just going to power through and we're going to blackmail the mayor. And the mayor was like, I see that you're trying to blackmail me, and that's fine. I'm offering you a very fair deal, or I can turn you loose to the forest that surrounds this town that's covered with monsters that you're not strong enough to deal with. So about that fair deal I'm offering you. And they were like, it actually is kind of a fair deal. Yeah, yeah, no, when you put it like that, <laughs> suddenly I'm very uh, open to negotiations. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So again, it was like that um, they're trying to change the mood, so recognize their change in that mood. Um, I learned this technique two ways. <clears throat> One, I was that guy in college. Okay. I was always trying to be clever, be funny, um, to change the mood of the thing, to get attention, to show that I was clever, um, and a lot of the times to convince my professors to give me a higher grade. <laughs> Didn't work. <laughs> They're like, you know what? You are really, really funny. You know that, Gray? So you know what? You should have applied that to the creative writing thing that you didn't turn in. You still fail. Well, at least we know I can do the stuff. And isn't that what it means at the end of the day, Professor, <laughs> that I've learned your lesson? No. Oh, yeah. It totally shows that you learned my lesson. But it also shows that you don't follow directions. You yep. still fail. <laughs> you yeah, know? that's that's always one of the things that... when. <laughs> Because I got a I got a history degree in college. People go, oh, well, what'd you learn in a history degree? And I'm like, look, look, the subject matter is honestly a lot less important than the methodology behind how <laughs> you get the thing. Because you know, any college degree teaches you to work on a long-term project, finish that project, see it through to completion, meet deadlines. Uh, you know, a history degree specifically is going to teach you how to. Uh, take large amounts of data, boil it down into something other people can understand in a relatively narrative format. There's a lot of this that is about the methodology. You don't need to know what I know about the history of, like, British, uh, you know, modern British history or, you know, the, the formation of the German Empire. That data is not relative to you, but the formation of, I don't know, how I can tell you those things. Mm-hmm. That's pretty important. Yeah. And uh, I often yeah. tell people that university is not as much for your degree as it is to learn to learn. Yes. And yes. Um, But the second way I got this, the, the second way that I got the mm -hmm. um, powering through through the bathos, again, that was the college thing, and the professor was going, no. Yeah. No. I see your bathos, and I counter you with no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the second way that I learned to power through it um, was – to be that guy in improv. Okay. Okay. The 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 straight man. Not the straight man. The dramatic improviser. Mm, okay. Okay. Um, most people with improv, they go straight for comedy. They're trying to make the audience laugh. But if I could get them compelled to a dramatic scene, because I saw a movie when I was like, God, um, thirteen. Okay. It was all improv. None of the movie was scripted, but it was British. 
And I say this because they study the craft in Britain. Here we study the craft of marketing. So, um, yeah, so they study the craft and it was an entirely unscripted, improv drama. Huh. From the BBC that was shot in one take. <laughs> I'm just like... That is, I would say that is, that is a piece of art right there. I, I'm interested in seeing what that is. And it was a compelling story. I wish you could remember the name of it, but this was 20 years ago. Huh. And it was the first time I saw that improv didn't just mean comedy. Yeah. Because I grew up, you know, watching stand-up comedy yeah. and all that stuff. Because everyone thinks of improv, improv comedy, and, yeah. yeah. And yeah. most of the um, most of the exercises that you can do with improv, people lean toward comedy because bathos cuts tension and when people are laughing s- the fact that someone is nervous isn't as much seen as the enjoyable so if you can you know, a- as the fact that people are now enjoying themselves because they're laughing so um, so as the GM when I see that someone is trying to cut my drama with bathos I double down on the drama hmm. um, when I see that someone is trying to con me with bathos I double down on you don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And um this keeps the stories that I write a little more compelling. And yeah. that and consequences. Well, know? yeah. The <laughs> the consequences I feel like should aren't even a part of this specific conversation because they should be part of every game regardless of how much bathos is there or <laughs> yeah. not. Um you know, if you just have consequence free games why are you playing a role playing game instead of a board game yeah you know you're even a one shot should have those consequences well, when i say consequences and the straight man you know who does this perfectly okay who? the guardians of the galaxy movies mm, okay yeah um star lord is always going to try and do bathos always always that's yeah just, that's, that's his character yeah, literally that's totally his, character. his character gamora is always going to be the straight man yes okay you always got gamora going Okay, you're an idiot. This is a serious thing, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, you know who cuts through the bathos most? Drax. Exactly. Yeah. The literalist. Yeah. <laughs> you have the literalist. Yeah. You know, I'm here. I've mastered the art of standing so still. No one can see me. Yeah. And he, he is completely <laughs> unflappable by someone trying to cut the tension because he just does not understand what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. And... He can be used for bathos. He can be used against bathos. Yeah. Um, he bridges when, the two really well. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah. When he, I mean, when it's done properly. Um, I recently watched Infinity War again. Yeah. And it was done perfectly with Drax when they found Thor. Mm. It's like, no, no, Mr. Quill. You are a dude. This is a man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I need to watch that movie again. Yeah. Like, it was, it was so good. And I... I forget that it is, it is in effect another Guardians of the Galaxy movie in a lot of senses because they featured very prominently in it. Yes, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, of course, you know, the bathos came in when Quill was like, You are not taking my ship, sir! Are you trying to make your voice sound like his? Uh, I'm not! This is how I always speak. Well, that is good to know that that is how you always speak, little spaceman. Yeah. Is the rabbit your captain? Yes, he is like... An angel was, yeah. you know, an angel and a god had a baby or something like that. Yeah. And, um, but again, they use bathos properly. Yeah. Because in Guardians 2, Peter finding out who killed his mom and the way that he reacted to that, there was no bathos. There yeah. Was, there was yeah. None. You had there to was... sit with that and you had to, like, really chew on how he was going to handle this and then he. He, the he guy didn't. who normally, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm saying the guy who normally comes back and cuts all the tension with a joke could not bring himself to cut that level of tension. Yes. And yes. I was, I, I found that to be a very compelling moment as a result. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is what it was supposed to be. Yeah. So when people are tripping all over themselves to be the clever one, all it does is bring down the depth of the story. And that yeah. is, that is what I'm. That is mainly what I'm talking about is, again, I don't hate Joss Whedon, you know, I don't, I'm saying that right now. Yeah. I don't enjoy his work because his bathos, um, his use of bathos makes the story more shallow. Yeah. Okay? Um, again, the biggest place that I've seen in his work where I just said, nope, I'm done, I'm done, I'm finished, was the end of Angel, where 
they went through the whole thing. They had the climax, and um, um, they released a dragon to kill the bad guy and all that stuff. And they're like, yeah, we just saved the city. That was hard. And good old Cordelia coming in there with, wow, you have a whole bunch of piss in you. Let me take it all out. That's one way to look at it. Or you could look at it like you just unleashed a dragon on the entire city. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> You yeah. know, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the piss out of me and removing the entire emotional depth of the climax of the show. Yeah. You know, because um, that was the last episode of the show. So it was yeah. like, yay, we saved the city and you doomed it again. Well, yeah. thanks. Thank- why did we even bother? You yeah. know, why? Um, so that's that's how Bathos <clears throat> comes out, comes off when everyone's racing to be the clever one. Yeah. You know, and so when you guys are stuck in your writing, we've got but, we've got therefore, we've got the essence of what makes comedy comedy and what makes drama drama. And the reason we did that last week was so when you're coming down with your stuff, once you decide which direction you're going, you have to have the right ratios. Mostly drama with a little comedy, Mostly comedy with a little drama. But if you're doing mostly drama with a whole bunch of comedy, you're not gonna it's not gonna be a drama anymore. Yeah, it doesn't feel like drama. <clears throat> yeah. Which if that's what you're going for, like you say, great. Mm-hmm. But if you're trying to go for that drama and you just let the comedy ruin it and ruin that tension, you no longer have a compelling drama. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, so we cover Bathos this week. Understand what it is. Uh anti climax. Um, it's anticlimax. It's the thing that completely removes the fulfillment of the feeling that the writer is going for at the moment. Okay. Um, if you have a dramatic scene, um, go through with the drama. Go through the catharsis of playing out all of the things that make it sad or scary. You know, um, a great example of this kind of bathos um, taken to the wrong level. I mentioned one movie in Big Trouble in Little China. Mm-hmm. You might not know it, but John Carpenter wrote that as a horror flake. Yeah, I, I would not have known that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the second, believe it or not, is Evil Dead Part 2. Okay. If you don't know you're going into a comedy, it looks like a bad movie. Yeah, because okay. Because everything yeah. is built up to be, you know, and the book and this and that. But then you've got the girlfriend and the and the demons and and the trees attacking and every and all the deadites trying to do the stuff to Bruce Campbell. It's tragic and sad and scary if you don't know that they did it for laughs. And yeah. that's where all the slapstick came out and all the okay. over the top Bruce Campbellisms that we've come to know. <laughs> know and know. love, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but without those, you've got Evil Dead 1, The Evil Dead. Yeah. Which was an intentional horror movie that wasn't done very well because they didn't know what they were doing. They were young filmmakers and it had a lot more comedy than they intended. Hmm. So, you know, um, and that just came out from what was, well, it came out from their lack of budget, their lack yeah. of professional <clears throat> effects and things like that. But it, it is known, <laughs> it is known that um, part two, they said, well, we don't have what we need to make this genuinely scary. Right. But we can't make it. What if the Three Stooges um, met the devil? Yeah, that works. That works. Yeah. And like, that's what it came out as. And once they decided that it was going to be a comedy it worked yeah you know so <clears throat> with your writing play to your strengths so do what you know what what to do especially when you're writing gaming campaigns understand who you're dealing with i always have to think if x player is going to be in my game they're going to try and insert comedy to derail everything i'm writing yeah cool i'm going to write around that guy <laughs> yeah um having a Having a good, and this can be a topic for another time in Mm -hmm. depth, but having the knowledge of how your characters play always makes such a huge difference when you're writing your story because you know if I put this amount of hook out there, 
this guy is going to latch onto it or like, nah, this group is not going to catch this level of subtlety or, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Know your audience. Yes. Yeah, always yeah. know your audience. That is that is rule number three. <laughs> know your audience. Um, but guess what? What? That's time. It sure is. Like we're we're actually. I'm trying not to run too far over. Yeah, no, but we, um, we you know, trying to keep these shows tighter. And what you guys don't know is that last week, after a thing, we actually sat down for notes. I know. <laughs> can you? Can it's almost like we're we're getting good at this or something or better. I wouldn't go that far. Yeah, yes. we're getting better. 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. right. As you said, practice makes permanent. Yes. <laughs> but, yes. Um, but yeah. So I'm I'm trying to keep this tight. But um. Let me know, guys, if you guys really like these, uh, the last segments on Game Gallery where we start talking about um, writing and all that stuff. Because I enjoy doing it, but... I've been enjoying it quite know. a bit. I mean, I, I personally have learned a lot more through the last few sessions about how to be a better writer of role-playing games, so... Yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm going to vote we keep doing them. <laughs> well, I, I want to keep doing them, but honestly, if they don't want to see it then we won't do it and i'll just put it on another show <laughs> that's true you know, that's yes i have the power to produce is in two days left in the week that i can <laughs> um, well. but yeah so with all that i'm gonna say man thank you for showing up today and thank you for having seriously, me seriously like you showed up on time forcing me to be more on time and that was you know that's one of those things hey you know do what i can <laughs> and um of course Thank you guys for showing up, tuning in, and clicking on this video. Um, thank you, patrons out there, because you know you got that whole thing. And again, we got the Patreon up and going, so spread the word. Yeah. Um, spread the word to the patrons. Um, yeah. Spread Come the check word. it out, you guys. Yeah. Uh, a lot have, of yep. fantastic quality stuff on the Patreon. Yeah. And honestly, I'm not being one of those Patreons who are like, give us all this money. If you can, you know, our first tier is literally called doing what you can. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just that's just a dollar, a dollar a month. So if you could help us out with that, that'd be that'd be amazing. If you can't help us out there, because you know, one, it's the holiday season, two, I'm broke, a lot of you guys are broke. But if you got an Amazon Prime account, <laughs> yeah. go on to the back end and just subscribe to us through Amazon Prime. That helps. Yeah. Um, subscribe to the Twitch channel, yeah, that subscribe is. Subscribe to the Twitch channel on Amazon Prime. Um cost you nothing extra. Yeah, not at all. Nothing extra at all. Yeah, nothing extra, and you know, you guys can help us out in a lot of ways, not just with the monies, um, because we're not just a channel, we're building a community. Yeah. So get out there, get your friends together gaming, have them watch our shows, have them um, join join all of the different groups that we got, subscribe to all the channels. We are doing what we can to make everything inclusive and welcoming for everybody, except for the people that don't want to make things welcoming. <laughs> I ain't about being polite to fascists. Okay, I'm not that guy. Yeah. Well, I'm hey, saying. that can be a topic for next time. Yeah, yeah. Um, cuz we we can certainly go into depth on that. Oh, I'm just I'm just saying that. I'm we're, See, this is the exit sequence. Oh. Catch up. <laughs> yeah, catch up. <laughs> so yeah. So like I said, you know, help us out with all that stuff. And of course, you can totally 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 help us out by going to yeah, that's right. Heading over to backinthedeck at gmail.com. That is B-A-C-K-I-N-T-H-E-D-E-C-K at gmail.com. That's uh, where you can send us an email if you guys want to let us know what you think or give us some other stuff like that. Um, check out the archive and subscribe to our YouTube. Hit that little bell for notifications so you guys know when we put more stuff in the archive. And that's just look for Back in the Deck or BidP on the YouTube. Now, join up <coughs> with our Twitter so you can see some of our debates and all of our talks and things like that. Um, so, um, and that is at Back in the Deck. Join Deckers on the Book. Deckers on the Book is the Facebook group. I know you got a Facebook. I got a Facebook. I got like three Facebooks. I know the Dugger Nuts got a Facebook and Lights to Hint got a Facebook. So if you got a Facebook, just join the group. Join the group. Talk to some of us. Have your friends join the group. You know, talk to any of them. Now, if you are also people that happen, um, to like listening to podcasts, I don't know why you would, you know, I mean, it's not like this is a podcast or anything. Ha ha ha. Um, head over to SoundCloud and listen to the audio archive, which is all the audio from all of our shows, um, at your leisure because it's on SoundCloud. It's going to stay there. And you can download it to your computer for yourself 
for free, forever, for you, from us. And that's at SoundCloud slash BID underscore P. Um, hit us up on the Instagram at Back in the Deck. And is there a way they can get a hold of you, Mr. Duggernaut? Oh, the usual. Uh, hit me up on Deckers on the Book. Or you can uh, try to find me on Twitter. I'm not super active on Twitter anymore. So honestly, Deckers on the Book is going to be the best way to get a hold of me. Awesome, awesome, and awesome with that. And I'm going to say with that, thank you guys for coming down to the game gallery today. And if anybody tells you that you can't like what you like because of the circumstances of your birth, be it your race, religion, creed, gender, identity, sexual preference, disability, or your budget, you just tell them to take those cards and put them back in the deck. This is Solar Gray, the cinematic source. We're saying thank you, and we will see you next time on the game gallery.